Hi, welcome, and in this video we'll be showing you this engine, uh, how it was built, how you possibly could look at some of these things and figure out how to do your own by using this and a manual, and also some other advice maybe online, but this might help you get through one of these type of engine builds. This is a 2007 engine, and the 2007 has a 78 stroker crank, and a 90.5 uh, cylinder. Uh, it has aluminum case and a bunch of other things. I'm gonna show you all the parts here in a minute. And then I'm gonna show you the whole build through this whole video. I had like three videos to do this and I figured I might as well make one that you can watch and see the whole thing start to finish and have that to kind of help you see someone else build it. Maybe you'll learn something from that. So. The reason I call it a bulletproof engine is because it's a 78 stroker with an aluminum case that has shuffle pins inside of it to keep the case from moving. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going involved in this whole engine that make it last. Um, I've known people who've got this engine done like this and they've gotten up to like 150,000 miles out of them. So you're on most VW engines, uh, back in the old days when we built them we were lucky to get a hundred thousand miles out of a stock 1600 uh, but when you do some of the engineering changes that we did to this one and being it also being bigger and more powerful um, you can get really good reliability and this is without getting it to really ex super expensive extreme parts there are stuff that's way better than this but this is like an affordable bulletproof build so stay tuned, we'll take a listen to it and move forward from there. Bulletproof is a pretty loose term because uh, bulletproof doesn't mean it's going to be as good as your new Toyota. That means it's going to be, you know, as good as a Volkswagen can get. So let's talk about these things one at a time now you might wonder why i have this old cylinder tin here and you might say well you can go out and buy brand new stuff it's you know cheap and everything else but the reason you want all the original stuff is because it has this original tin it has still has the original deflectors so even though that one's been crushed okay i can straighten it out i can weld it i can put it back together um, that's probably better tin than the other tin also it actually ends up fitting better. You'll find that the cheap stuff doesn't fit. So even this fan shroud, we're gonna go ahead and fix it because of all the stuff that's inside of it is all original and it's formed to the right direction and they do work better than the aftermarket except for possibly uh, the scat ones are usually about as good as the original ones and that's yeah, the only other one. They might even be better. Um, so. The scat ones are, are, you know, pretty much anything scat is going to be high quality. So we have a German gasket set. Um, comes with a red seal. And also the thing that's changed in the years recently is the quality of the pushrod tube seals is actually a lot better than the original old ones that they had back in the early days. So a lot of people think that all the parts from overseas is are garbage. And a lot of times that's true. But AA, uh, th this AA performance, but these are the uh, 90 and a half from AA. So if you wanted to go to a, a 1776 or, you know, or stroker motor, these are B pistons, so they're going to be good for a stroker. Um, if A is the A piston and they have a B piston, and it's basically the uh, piston pin height is different on them so that... Um, it'll make up for the the stroke so the, these are b pistons so let's if you guys are new to that um b pistons are for the stroker motors a pistons are for 69 millimeter crankshafts that are stock okay i got a lot of interesting things here too i even know it's in this uh silver line's a good brand for bearings so uh that's a good one you know Club and Schmidt's even better if you have it. And the Dockhouse Fan Shroud is the only way to go for a bulletproof engine. So if you don't know what that is, real quick, I'll show you. 
doghouse has the fan the cooler is actually mounted on the back and it has its own exit point all the air exits out um, that little piece that could, pieces together that goes on the back side of this and actually it exits out this port right here so when you have that you also have to have this tin absolutely see there's the there's a little thing and this one kind of goes like that like that and then it connects to the other so all the air goes out and through the goes up to the front of the engine and then go goes to the back of the car so doghouse that's the one thing in addition to that when you're building a bulletproof motor um, you want to have an additional oil cooler these MP ones right here have a really nice setup because it has a fan and this is I think what a 70 pass or something 72 72 pass so it has a lot of places for the oil to be cooled off I mean these things here will make a huge difference um, with an aluminum case a lot of people say they run hotter than the uh, mag case because it doesn't dissipate the heat as well which is true but then again you're dealing with aluminum not magnesium and aluminum is much uh, much stronger and it doesn't uh, expand and contract as much as mag so it's a more consistent uh, thing to have as an engine case but um, that's why they made the late models and Porsches uh, out of aluminum so if you look here uh, this is going to be in addition so you're going to have we're going to have the doghouse fan shroud and we're also going to have in addition to that a secondary portion of flow of the oil to go through this and also through an oil filter spin on oil filter so I'm going to compare the heads over here in the next part but when you do a stroker motor you're also going to need these kind of push rods here uh, where they, you, you actually make them to the right length and these sets are available I think these are chromoly I'm not sure yeah chromoly so they're extra long um, and you can cut them to the length you need so the problem with the chromoly ones is is you got to set them at zero there's a little bit more to know about that um, in, in other parts so the other thing you need with a bulletproof engine is an eight dowel flywheel so this is not a chromoly flywheel if you were going to go racing and you want to go chromoly um, but um, we are we are going to use a chromoly uh, gland nut and they also have these in a larger size if you're going to be a racer and you want to go big time but then again you're gonna to have to put that trans behind it or you're gonna be blowing that up so yeah well, they also have these adjustable to make the to, to make to, the to make the right length you need to um, if you want to make that work out. I think those ones are just cut to fit, right? Yeah. Yeah. With a, a chromoly rod, okay. Uh, and like I said, these can be you know this can be a little bit pricey when you get to this stuff. Uh, not that much really compared to you know if you break down the road. So, but again, we're talking about bulletproof street. We're not talking about racing. We're talking about bulletproof street. Um, these are uh, I beam rods. They also have H rods. Um, we didn't feel we need to go with the H. Um, the I beam chromolys should be plenty strong. We're not going to be running really high RPMs. So these are the type of things you need to talk, think about when you're engineering your own build. Um, you know, the H rods would be really good for like a turbo engine or high rev. If you're going to run 48s, you know, maybe do the H rods. Um, even then, you could probably still use these. So if you compare these to the stock rods here, um, these have a little more clearance and stuff like that. Um, these have regular nuts on them, and these have these uh, much stronger bolts to go through them. And they're just they're just engineered better. These are the AA Performance ones. Uh, there's other brands. Some guys like better than these, but AA seems to make, like I said, you know, they make a lot of stuff overseas. But um, we've been running their stuff, and we've not had really any problems unless we're going into the crazy race mode. You know, like I said, if you're going on the street, I was going through my cases, and I didn't feel like the cases that I had were good enough. Uh, because you're going to have to do a lot of machine work to your case. So if you keep this in mind, um, a lot of times by the time you get, especially you guys who are Midwest, back East, something like that, where you may not have access to machine shops, you may have to ship it out to a machine shop, have it to ship back to you. Um, these come pre-cut, so these will take a stroker crank, I think up to 82 millimeter. Uh, I don't know, you have to check with them, tell them what you're trying to get. 
and um, they, they again they have these at AA performance they also have these at carcraft they have them at CB performance and the funny thing is is they're pretty much from what I know they're pretty much all the same uh, mold from what we've been able to tell but what they do is each manufacturer does different things to them so one person will machine it down so that these both are exactly the same on this side and on the other side I think CB performance does that um, another manufacturer will machine down here and put their logo on it uh, you know and basically we found that them to be pretty much all the same across the board just price is your most important thing really and then uh, and you know it, and it'd be nice if you didn't have to double shim because on this side uh, you know you see with that little stair step there you may have to have an additional shim on there to, to make up for that so you're gonna have to check all your cylinders um, and make sure that they're all the same deck height so those are all things that when you whenever you build a motor you have to build a deck height. you're gonna you, we're gonna have a motor build coming up so it'll help you guys that are back east that have never maybe built a motor to learn a little bit about how to do it the right way so also, uh, Plug VW Darren does a lot of cool motor builds, and he'll walk you through it pretty well. He's, I thought he was pretty darn good at just, you know, information and getting you to be able to build your motor. So you can check out his channel uh, and uh, see, if, see if there's something on there you can get to help you. So, because I'm, like I said, I'm not really the motor guy. I was around all the engine guys. Chris is a motor builder. I always have to ask him uh, what he thinks is the best stuff because a lot of it's changed over the years and I used to build stuff for myself years ago and I did you know worked on customers cars and stuff like that but I was not particularly the guy to go to to build a motor I was more of a guy to you know show you how to weld up your old car and, and, and get it painted the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna for for a bulletproof motor build is uh, especially with an aluminum case uh, having the extra sump for the oil is really good um, when you have when you have a mag case sometimes when you put one of these on there uh, if it's not done properly, uh, you can have a strength issue because the case is, cases aren't as strong as these aluminum ones are. So, uh, but with an aluminum case, man, this is like really the way to go. Um, I'm not certain, me and Chris were talking about that, why they would redesign and make a whole new aluminum case and not put an additional two quarts. It just blows me away that they didn't do that. So, here's the things called cool tin. What they are, they're type 3 engine 10 these go under the cylinders uh, these are the things that everybody I always tell people you need these on your engine to help it run a little bit cooler for today's fuel um, it really does help and these go under the push rods so if you're gonna change these without um, without taking the, the heads off um, you're gonna have to change to the push rods that extend and you know the spring-loaded push rods so Chris is bringing over the original one so this is kind of how they go. So what it does is it controls the air completely going around your piston, around your cylinder, and uh, makes it go through this metered area so that uh, it diverts the proper amount to go around your cylinders, and then it makes sure it goes all the way around your cylinder. And I'll show you what the original ones are like in a second. It's so that more air will go to your heads where all the where all the combustion's made in your heads. So. Here's the original one, which was kind of a little hokey design. Um, it went between the two cylinders like this, so you always had a gap of air going around here. And you'll find that if you ever had a blown piston, that the part of your piston where it gets cooked is always right here. So it kind of makes sense. Um, that's going to be your hard, hardest part of your piston is where this thing did not allow the air to go around it. Um, so that's what that's what we found over the years almost always whenever you had a burnt piston it'd be burnt right here we're right past where that shield was it would be like right in there so with these things able uh, controlling the air and getting it to go all the way around your piston is really a beneficial thing and it does upgrade the engineering of the volkswagen i had these really good mexican heads these are the mexican heads are probably one of the best uh, heads to buy you know for original stock if you're just going to rebuild it um, these are really well built okay and they had that little bit more beefed up around the spark plugs on them if you see here than even the original ones but look at what they did with AA what they did is they go with the small peanut spark plug and you see and how much more built up this is 
and how the combustion chamber has a better form to it. So if you see here, the form of this, how this is made, this has a better flow of air. These have larger valves than the stock heads. Um, so a lot of the issues are, are cracks between the valves and cracks between the spark plug and the valve um, with the other, with a lot of the heads, especially when you go big, big valve. Um, so also opened up a little more for the fins. There's not as much gas in it. Yeah, they, they actually made the fins so that there's better airflow going through there. So a lot of times, you know, you're going through and trying to modify that. Um, they don't have the plate on here, which we're going to have to put on there. I noticed that. They, have, they usually have a little plate that covers this. So that needs to be on there. If you're going to build your own, you need to take the little plate off of your other heads and put it on there. So, um, yeah, they're like that right here. So that needs to be there. That it helps, you know, the same thing. It does the same thing. This thing does the same thing that this little shield does. And it diverts the air out to go around the heads. So those need that definitely needs to be on there. The other thing is the ports are larger. They have a better flow to them. Uh, you know, so it's so much better for today's fuels. Um, the exhaust ports, look at that. I mean, if you can look at this and how that just goes straight through to the valve, and you look at this one like turns a right-hand corner almost. If you look at it, it's like, and there's a big old giant clump in there. Look at this. Let's look at this. Compare so you can see it. Um, you can't really see inside this one. I got you. But yeah, it's, it, it, it just flows. Maybe we can turn the light on. There you go. So if you can see how much more is in the way in there, it, it, it just, it almost makes a right hand turn on the one with my thumb. And this one kind of just flows straight in. So at, it, it, it's such, those subtle things are a really huge difference when it comes to head flow. So when you have better flow through your heads, um, you're talking about better performance. You're talking about better cooling. The air goes through, the air and fuel mixture goes through the head easier. You know, it's just going to be, it's just going to be better. It's more efficient. It's not, you know, there's not as much waste. When there's less waste, there's less friction. You know, there's, it's just, you know, it's just a better way to run, you know, your engine. So that's why I decided, you know, if you can look at the intake ports or, they're, you know, they're significantly larger, not a huge amount. You could actually open them up a little bit more if you wanted to. And port match the intake manifold, which we, what's what we're gonna do. We always do that um, when we do the build. And they also come with uh, these. Come, you can get them with the other options. You can get them with dual springs. You can get them with high rev springs. These here, we got single high rev springs on these um, because we want a single high rev springs because we don't really need the dual springs. We don't want that much. Um, and you know, we're gonna be revving it really high. So. Anyway, the camshaft we're going with, we have a performance cam. Uh, this was a used cam, but it was in great shape, and it has basically the right grind we're looking for. I think it's similar. I'm just going to say similar. I like to use the angle numbers because everybody knows them. It's similar to an angle 120. Yeah, and for this big of a motor, that will actually work really well, and still give us, you know, performance. But with not, we're not going to, we're not going to put a lot of carburation on it. We're going to go with really low carburation, so we don't blow up our tranny. Because we do not have a built tranny for this. It will work as long as I don't go out and just punch it. You know, you just don't want to drive like that. It's just not, you know, if you drive like that, you're going to be, you know, putting a tranny in it. You... So what I was going to say here is on the crankshaft. The crankshaft that we got is a chromoly. What is it? There's two different ones in chromoly. We wanted the best one. 340 chromoly, uh, which is the better one. They, they, you know, they have a crassa if you're really old school. I mean, those, those are really good, but that, by the way. But if you look here, it's counterweighted. So, uh, it, so my whole thing is, is guys go, well, you know, stroke motor is not going to be as reliable as original. Um, you know, and the thing is, is yes, it can be as long as you don't punch it. As long as you don't put the, put the big carbs on it, uh, you, you're, you're going to have a strong motor. The bottom end can be really strong. Where guys go wrong is they start putting all the freaking high, high rev dual, dual springs on it. You put the, you know, you're going to go high compression. You're going with, a, you know, 48s and all that stuff. And, you know, then, you know, or, or turbo, you know, then you, your reliability goes way down, you know, and because you're pretty much pushing the engineering to the limit. But uh, what I would say is every engine, if you're going to go bulletproof, if you're going 69 millimeter, 
you, you want to go counterweighted. So really, uh, this is a counterweighted crank. This is a stock crank. And you can see these counterweights here. Um, and so it, we're going with a 78 because, you know, today, back in the old days, when you used to buy a, a, a stroker motor, you know, the difference in price of just the crankshaft alone, like I used to get a like a, a 69 millimeter, I think it was uh, counterweighted, and they were like around 100 bucks or something like that, $99. And then, then the, uh, the, the stroker motor, even a 78 or 60, 76, 74, anything stroker was 250 and, and up for a crankshaft. So back then, you know, you could get a whole engine kit for 250 bucks or 300 bucks. So why would you go stroker? So, you know, today it's not that way at all. It's almost like you go 69 stroker. Or 69 or you go stroker and it's almost the same price the difference is you got to get the case clearanced so in in our case we didn't have a good enough case that was worth putting the money into getting clearanced i mean we have a case that's good but it's not you know it's on its last machine so you know we don't want to spend money on getting the, the case machined out when uh when basically you know it's going to be on its last run so we've spent all that money on machine work why not just go ahead and just get an aluminum one and it's fresh, it's new, it doesn't have any, it's never been machined, and it already comes ready to go. So it was like a couple hundred dollars more just to go with, you know, a few hundred dollars, maybe four or five hundred bucks more to go with the aluminum. And, you know, for and, and you think about it, for five hundred bucks, you got a stronger case. So, you know, it's kind of a no-brainer. So, but anyway, you always go counterweighted for, uh, and also eight dowel. So this is what an eight dowel crank looks like. This is what the other one looks like. It's only got four dowels to hold the crankshaft. And, you know, if you see the Porsches and stuff like that, they have flanges or regular cars have flanges. So they're even stronger than these. So this is kind of, like I said, this is a little bit kind of pushing the engineering. That's why I don't like to go too much bigger than this on a stroker and say it's still bulletproof. A 78 is kind of right at the limit of uh, bulletproof. Uh, you could probably even do an 82 and be bulletproof, but... You know, as long as I said, you know, as long as you're not punching it, as long as you're getting on it. But yeah, I think the 78 is a safer number for the stroke. So anyway, also we're going with the upgraded uh, oil pump. The oil pump has a high volume, uh, not only for the engine, but it's going to be for the oil cooler system and the oil filter. Um, so it's going to have to run a lot more oil through the through the through the through the engine and, and all the piping. So you really need a high volume oil pump. We're going with a, what is it, 26 millimeter? 26 millimeter oil pump. And that's the kind of thing that you need for your uh, bulletproof build. The other thing we're doing is, uh, real quick, forgot about this, is instead of a regular, okay, you have your doghouse fan cooler, which is fine. They're plenty adequate if you want, if all you have is a doghouse cooler, but we happen to have a type four. So we had a type four oil cooler sitting around and if you modify the shroud a little bit, you can fit this extra, uh, it has like two more passes in it. So it, it goes up and down these things here to go through to cool the oil. And this one actually has two extra ones inside of it that are more than the regular VW uh, flat four one has. So if you happen to have one of these, if you're lucky enough to find one, uh, a type four is a, is a good also upgrade for um, keeping the oil very cool. Before you ever start one of these, you definitely need to take everything apart and blow out every hole, uh, take carburetor cleaner, spray it in all the holes or, or brake cleaner, spray it in all the holes, all the oil galleys, every hole like here, here, I mean everywhere, and make sure you blow everything out really clean, make sure there's no debris, no extra little machining pieces or anything. Uh, but uh, we've got everything all laid out, you, you know, get everything all set up and laid out before you start. It makes, helps a lot or organize, organize is good. And on a couple of things we need to do before we get going is see how these, if you notice uh, these bearings, we've already done this one, but um, the bearings don't line up quite perfect with the oil holes um, so you'll find that the oil holes are supposed to line up with this groove 
and you know they don't they don't line up so what we do is we see you have that subtle grinding spot there you can see we grind a little spot in there to help the oil find this groove so it lines up better with that so that gives you a lot more oil pressure um, that's match porting your oil um, stuff the other thing we did is we match ported the ports on this on the oil pump with the case you see here not on this end on the other half this one here we've already um, we we tap this out we're going to put a plug in there because we're using a uh, full flow system you watch my oil pump video for that um, but this one here we match ported this if you see god damn it, i don't know why that thing's not focusing here we go. You see how that's ported? That actually matches up with the oil pump. So we made it everything together. This case here has, uh, what are these called? Shuffle pins. Shuffle pins in it. So it doesn't, it, you don't have to, uh, it doesn't have O-rings that goes on these. So unlike your other cases, um, if you have these with the shuffle pins in them, they're really long, different than the other ones that come on them. The other ones are really, really thin. It comes in the regular case and they don't look quite as long as this and then you you would have to put your o-rings here this this case does not require that and what that does is that helps the case from vibrating and your line bore could last a lot longer by doing that that's why these aluminum cases are far superior to the others so so we'll show you real quick how to do the bearing here we're going to use paint we usually use a paint marker but we can't find it right now just put a little bit of paint around the, that's the oil galley hole. Mm -hmm. And then you set the bearing in place. Match them in there, and then you kind of push on it a bit. Use the mallet maybe. Just get it in place. And pick the bearing back out. You paint it here. Set your bearing in place. Last one, we did another little cut on this and didn't come out that great. Let's hope it comes out good this time. But uh, usually we use the yellow paint marker, so this is a little different way to do it. But it tells you where the hole lines up. Mm, didn't give us a really right good there. reading, but yeah, you can see right there. that it's only half of the hole is touching the bearing. And look right here, this is the oil groover right here. See how much it actually overlaps? Yeah, it doesn't doesn't mate up with those holes because of these dowel pins here so you got to make sure that those are in your case as well so that's going to correct a little so just by just machining this little area right here like the one bearing that i showed you let's look at that one again like this one where is that actually this isn't it that's the other one this one like we did with this bearing you see how we just took the and just kind of helped it find so the oil will uh, help it find to that center piece that'll give you a lot more oil pressure we do this on the new motor every new motor so just use this little uh, dremel tool be very careful doing this That's all it needs, just a little bit, just to kind of help the oil find the groove. So in these stroker cranks, they have all of the, they have little plugs in them like this. And you need to take out all these plugs, okay? And then you need to clean everything out, out of sight, you know, blow it all out with the same way. Make sure you use brake spray and a lot of air. Make sure that the, there's no machining stuff still in there and then when you put these back in you need to use some red loctite put it on the threads and then put them in place yeah red loctite put them back in make them tight make sure you do that if you don't do that we've seen them come apart just from that in place so with the woodruff key in place we use a hot plate. Some guys use a torch. You can do whatever you, whichever way you want. Uh, we just use a hot plate because then it makes a nice consistent heat. And then they're both sitting there hot. And you can just slam them both on. 
and we use pliers to put them on. Some guys use a glove. Um, those things get pretty freaking hot. Um, pliers is a good way to grab them. So you don't have to worry about the gloves. Okay, this end here goes down. Like that. And you fall it on the ground. Right after you just cook it. Oh, we should do that in slow motion. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so go ahead. The notches go down. And we mark, we've got our bearings marked. If you can see the little marks there. We didn't have our paint markers, so usually we'll use it for that too, but you can just scribe it in there real carefully. So it goes down. Make sure it's the right direction. If you get that upside down, it's a pain. you got to pull your gears back off. Okay. Then we'll go ahead and set the gears on one at a time. The dots are facing up. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to get out of his way a little bit. Sometimes that happens. It's tight. A little oil on there helps. Spacer. Spacer next. Let's see. Nice and tight on these. Uh, Choker cranks are a really tight tolerance. Okay, now the brass gear. Is there a direction for that one? No. no. Doesn't matter. Can't remember. Non Been a while since I've done one by myself. I usually had, um, yeah, and then turn your hot plate off, right? So you yeah. don't burn yourself. The good old snap ring. Especially while the gears are hot. Put the snap ring on, we'll spare you guys the details of that. You scratch the living crap out of your crank trying to do it sometimes. Back in the old days, I remember doing that. Alright, we'll bring you back into the video in a second here. You want to kind of do this all while it's hot so then they cool the crankshaft out from there. Clean the rods off with the brake spray and wipe them down really good, especially on the new rods because they have that cosmoline or oil on them or something. Right, so you guys who think you can just, uh, you know, bolt your stuff back on, you know, it's not always that way. We put these rods on and they feel tight. So right here you can see that this is kind of rubbing where this tang is. And sometimes the machining is just a hair off. And so what, you gotta, what we do is we just kind of lightly kind of sand that area down and very carefully fit these to the journal so um just so you know i mean this is kind of more of an expert type of a thing i mean if you're not up for the game listen you know cb performance builds these things really good and so does there's another place that's local to us called uh, brothers. brothers machine shop they build a really nice motor um and they they really put a lot of care into putting it together you're going to pay a lot of money for it, but you do have to fit some of the stuff. Um, so those had to be just lightly sanded, and we put them on, tighten them up, tap them, tap the sides of them with a hammer lightly, and kind of make sure that they seat properly, and then tighten them up a little bit tighter, then tap them on the sides, and then tighten them up to the torque spec, which we're not going to give you. We're going to let you guys look that up for the rods you got, because, you know, we may or may not be right. So... Um, I'd rather somebody else tell you something that's not correct, but, um, but we, we believe we have the correct specification for it, but I'm just telling you, um, how about this? It's, it's a little bit of fun. Once we get past this point, usually it's pretty easy, but, um, you really want the bottom end to just move freely. If it doesn't, if you tighten up, you put tighten up the rods and they don't move, you got to take them apart, start looking at them and look for stuff like that. If you can see that little spot where it's kind of crushed looking, that's what you need to work on. All right. All right, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you guys here um, this the stock rod so you can get this. It has, you know, if you look at the books and stuff, they have they show you to put this part up on your rod. And these new rods, and you can see these little tangs here, they go down. So the new ones, the Kermali rods, one of the reasons you need these rods is because they're clearance in the back here. And... Uh, and they also have stronger bolts in them and stuff, and they're stronger rods. But what you want to do is you want to put them on so that the tangs are down. 
So that's your mimicking the original, but you don't have that mark that they show in the books. If you ever have an old Volkswagen book, it'll show you this little this little thing here. These don't have it. So we're going to go ahead and assemble it up. Now we've already put this all together and we've already put them together one at a time and carefully went through and uh, looked for tighten them up, you know, and then made sure that the, we noticed that the bearings were where those little tangs are. Maybe their machine work was slightly off. We went ahead and adjusted that by just sanding the bearing a little bit. Perfectly okay. It's nice and tight. Now that we tighten them up, you'll see um, you put all the rods back on. Make sure you have the things in the correct position here. These little tangs in the right position. Yeah. On this side. Right there. And, um, you know, so those should be facing the camshaft. And then you go ahead and, and put, we're just using motor oil, right? Motor oil? Well, it's a little bit of a couple different things. It's uh, 2050 Marvel Mr. Oil and assembly loop. Assembly loop and Marvel Mystery Oil. That's what he uses. Everybody has a different formula. Some guys just use motor oil. That's fine. Um, I'm the old school guy who uses uh, oil and STP together mixed you know but it's sometimes that can be a little bit too thick especially for this kind of a motor so um, these are very tight tolerances and you know that's why that that motor goes together so but what you want to do is you want to run your rods around and make sure there's no tight spots in them that's the main thing so and if there is you'll take it apart and look at the rod and find those shiny spots in the bearing and then figure out what to do why, why is it yeah, we tap each rod and then retighten them. Um, that's the way you're supposed to do it. You check them once, tap them, and do them twice because it, it, they have to seat into the uh, into the just a little light love tap. There. So we'll go through and we'll do all these, and I'll bring you guys back into the video. They're all going to be the same. It's kind of repetitive. And we'll bring you guys back in the video when we're putting the crank into the motor. I think is that's the next step after this. Yeah, next step. Oh, something we don't usually do is some guys put Loctite on the rod bolts. Um, we found that that's not a good idea. We'll yeah, pull usually the out. end up pulling the threads out trying to take it back apart when, someday when you go to work on it. So um, you know, there, there's guys that will that will do that, but you know, that's not something we do. We usually just, we'll use a little oil. And to make sure it lubricates the threads and then torque it to the proper specification and usually that does it i mean some of your h beam rods and stuff like that um they they have stretch issues and stuff like that that you know, those are those are things you know it's better if you just don't even get into that and wait till you know it's something you have to graduate into you know going from a stroker to, from regular block to a stroker is a little bit more work and then uh even with the aluminum case you know, the cool thing about the aluminum case is it's a bolt-in type of thing versus, uh, you know, if you have the regular other one, you have to have it machined. And uh, so, anyway. All right, so one of the things you always do when you're putting it together is you take and drop your lifters in and you just kind of check the bores. You just make sure they're right. You know, even though it's a new case, you just make sure they're, they feel right. And then... Uh, we got the cam bearings in place. We just we just push them in, and then uh, we put that. This is assembly loop. We're using this stuff right here, CRC. I'll stay loop. I hit assembly loop. So we're gonna go ahead and drop the crank in now. We got all the bearings in place. Um, these are marked again so that we can find the ho the holes. There's little set pins, so you drop turn it around like that. Find the hole. Same thing up here. Turn around a little bit so that you know you're in the dowel pin and then it'll seat itself. You do it by feel, but the best way is to kind of mark those and just check it. Make sure there's good rotation. And then we'll um, tap it. Now yeah, always tap it uh, to make sure. Just to make sure it, it seats, the dowel pins are so tight sometimes that they seat themselves in 
You can check to see surface. if the bearing's uh, seated all the way by putting this cap on, and if you can wiggle the cap back and forth. Yeah, yeah, that's... Then it's not seated, but this one's tight. Right, so you check it with that, with the bearing, like that, by just wiggling it. If it's if it's wiggling back and forth, you'll notice it, it'll be, you know, there's you probably need to pull it back out, and then you'll see a dent in one of the bearings. Sometimes I've done it before years ago, and actually had to buy an extra, buy another set of bearings because oh, I happens. ruined one. Everybody. Yeah, I mean, everybody learns. <laughs> there's always a mistake. It's a $65 mistake right there. You learn that on your 1600 you know, when you just do the, you know, the used parts rebuild. But we're going to drop in the lifters now. You know, it, they need to fit just right. If they're too loose, then you need to have your lifter bores done. If, you're, if you have a, this is if you have another case. It's nice when you have these brand new cases because usually none of that stuff's an issue. But you always double check their machine work. So, because you just don't know. I mean, hey. Because the guy could have went to lunch right when that was going on or something. That actually happens a lot. Yep. I mean, it's not just because they're terrible machinists. I mean, everybody does makes mistakes. Every, everywhere in the world, people make mistakes. Okay, we're going to put the other cast, uh, half of the case on in a little bit once we get the cam set. we got to do some work to that. Um, we're going to actually, on the lifters, some guys you will use oil. Some guys use a special cam lube. Um, Sometimes we use uh, SDP and oil mixed. If you don't want 100% SDP, because SDP is so slippery, your cam may never break in. So um, we use a little bit of oil and some SDP together, because that has ZDDP in it, and that helps to make sure the cams lube properly during the break-in process. And there's going to be so much oil on there, pretty much it's going to wash some of that off and put it into the oil. But it gives it that first few minutes of protection, you know, slide, you know. You always wipe the STP is a great stuff for for assembly loop. I, I used to do all my engines by just using STP and oil mix. I learned that. That's what I learned doing V8s. Everything. Cam plug. Drop that in. Here's your cam plug. Here we always use silicone. I like this brand right here, Versacam Mega Black. Uh, we use that one and everything. Is that one open yet? Yeah. That stuff is like super strong. You put that on there, man. That's just, it's like a permanent gasket. You can put it in either way, but we use, I usually put the flat side to the inside uh, because if you have an auto stick or something, then you'll have an issue because uh, the flex plate will hit against that and just wear a hole through it. But I always run them this direction right here. That way you're covered either way. Does it even fit? Yeah, it fits. It's kind of a tight one. It'll fit there. Yeah, it's a really tight fit. That new case is just, it's weird, man. This aluminum is different, you know. One thing that's nice about the aluminum, I mean, everything's really tight-fitting. When you go to pull the case halves apart, it's really tight, even more tight than a, than a mag. It doesn't flex, you know. It's just a really strong way to do it. You know, what are you going to use around to, to seal the case, Chris? Are you going to? Hopes and dreams. You know, it's a so, Volkswagen, man. It everybody so. uses different <laughs> stuff. I mean, listen, there's a there's a million different ways to do it. I mean, I've heard of guys using silicone stuff. even, and you know, their motors don't blow up. You know, I think uh, I was watching VW Darren, and I was pretty shocked because a lot of us don't use that. Um, the guys out here use Yama Bond. I mean, that's Yama one bond, thing. There's um, Honda Bond. There's we did Yamabon, we've done this stuff, the Permatex number two for the case halves. Um, I've seen guys use the the just silicone. I mean they say that silicone has a film and I don't know. You know I think they all work. I mean I, it just depends on what you feel comfortable with. We like to use I like to use Yamabon. We don't have any, so we're gonna use that stuff right here. Permatex. Permatex is number two, I think. Yeah. Not the one not the one that gets hard. It's number two. So we'll go ahead and spread that on there. It takes a little bit to do. We'll bring you guys back in the video in a minute. We'll get a stop and clean the cam here. That standby are all safe, so it works pretty good. Oh we don't have the vacuum on. That's why you can hear it right now. Otherwise you could you wouldn't you'd be able to see a lot better. Be perfectly clear. Well in here, yeah. <laughs> Look at that thing, man. It works good. It's too lazy to get the vacuum out. Alright, so this thing here, when you put your cam gear on, 
you, you, you see how this is a straight line here? Okay, and it lines up with the one hole, and there's no hole on this side. So if that's facing you when you're holding it, that's the one where your 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 dot is supposed to be. So um, if you can see the little the, the little there's a little dot on the cam right there. It's hard to see because it's so clean. Um, that lines up with the dot, there we go. and it, that'll be the correct way to put it on. So if you try to put it on the opposite of that, there's no hole there. You see what I'm saying? And that's wrong. And that's wrong. Turn around where it's right. That's right. Okay? So your dot faces the hole there. All right? So that's fortune. All right. So we're going to line up the marks. you got, what, two on here, right? Mm -hmm. And you put the one that's on there between them. Okay? So that they're lined up. And then make sure it's turning correctly and not popping out. Sometimes you'll have one that's too tight and that way it'll tell you that the gear doesn't have any burrs in it too. So you always rotate it a couple times. Um, and then uh, we got to put the cam plug back in. We took it out. Um, one of the other things you need to do too is you need to take your oil pump okay, and, and test fit it at this point. Goes in here this way because you know this part lines up with the this part lines up with the center of the cam. That's what drives the pump. So you put this in this way, and then some of them. Every once in a while, you have one where this thing here, right here, will rub against the bolts on the pump. So you need to make sure you need you need to clearance that. See on the aftermarket in and out pumps, the, some 30 millimeter pumps, the melling pumps also. Mm -hmm. That's a problem because they're really chunky. Yeah, some of the, it just depends on the pump. It depends on which one you got. These ones are, these are like cheaper brand, and then not like the Melling or a little more expensive. Mm -hmm. But um, the cheaper ones usually, yeah, it's just, it's a hit and miss. You don't know. Just check it and make sure it doesn't hit. We're going to put this plug in here later, um, but this is also, remember, getting a plug put in there for the, uh, what's it called, uh, full flow system. All right, so we're ready to drop the case on. We put went to put these on both ends, uh, the brown stuff, just to make sure that it's you know got enough on there. Yeah. Then we're just going to set the rod straight up. But now we we don't have we can't find the uh, the clips for the, for the for the lifters. So hopefully we'll be lucky enough to get it together without them. Usually you have a clip that holds um, the lifters in place, and we can't find them right now when he moved his shop so we'll just uh, do it without it Let's see if it goes down oh got it. how did that go together like that it's pretty good because those aluminum cases are a little trickier than you know they're, they're very stiff the stuff goes on them really stiff so we'll seat it down he's going to use the pliers because we don't want to Drop the lifters down. Not yet. They didn't fall out, see? Pretty good. There it goes. That's the bad one. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Probably put the, uh, the center studs in. Put the center studs in and tighten them up a little bit slowly. Just start in the middle. The nice with the aluminum, you know, you, you, it doesn't. It's going to be really hard to, to to ruin, you know, like a mag case, you got to be really careful. I mean, they're so fragile. The aluminum's a lot stronger. It's still aluminum, but it's not steel. So you got to be a little bit careful with it. It's got the shuffle pins, so it's going to be a little tighter. Yeah, these has the shuffle pins in it, so it doesn't have the O-rings. Remember, around, usually... You have these rubber O-rings around all these studs between the case halves, but this one doesn't have that because it's got shuffle pins. What that does is stops the case halves from rubbing together. Mm -hmm. It makes it a lot stronger. I'm just going to put these on now dry and I'm going to tighten it all up, snug them up, and yeah. take them off and put sealant on them. Normally we put sealant on here, but we're going to tighten them down a little bit dry just to kind of get it dry fitted. You know, so that, you know, so that it's all snug down tight and then we'll take them back off and show you in a minute. We'll come back in the video. We've got the case on. I'll show you in the next second here.
So you go ahead and put some sealant on all these and then put your washers on. And put your nuts on. We always tighten, after we get done tightening these, we tighten these two first. Uh, because they're the, if you have a mag case, those are usually the first two to pull. Uh, I don't think we're going to have any problem with the aluminum. But I think what happens is usually over time the these come a little bit loose. You know, all these six. And then it puts all the stress on this one here and here. And uh, then it just causes that one to pull out. So, All right, so we got all these all torqued to 25 foot-pounds. And then we're going to put these two on here. And then check those first. And then we'll go around the rest of it put them all together. Always stop and check your rotation. You can put a little handle on this thing. One of these with a handle on it. So you can make sure everything's rotating freely. Rods are moving nice and easy. No issues there. So yeah, we're just uh, cleaning off all the excess stuff and get everything torqued down good. Let's we'll uh, finish out the rest of these case butt studs. All these here, put them all in and tighten them up. Pretty normal and boring stuff. I'll put you guys on hyperlapse or something. All right, so uh, we went ahead and dropped one of the cylinders on here. We still got to put case saver. Uh, Put our case savers in, uh, and then well, we've already checked the deck height. Uh, we use uh, we're going to use this tool right here um, to get these the Harbor Freight tools. If you don't have one of these, you can actually use a straight edge and a feeler gauge. I mean, that's the old school way to do it. Or they have a deck height measuring tool, which is still straight edge. And a, yeah, which is made. Well, it's like a steel a straight edge and a feeler gauge, you know. And then find out what your deck height is. On this thing, we found it was like fifty eight thousandths pretty tight and you can't just run it like that um, and we have to check both sides we'll check this side we'll pop it off we'll do the other side and it should be five thousand difference between one side and the other because this case has this little stair step here so um, on these on these aluminum cases you should always check both sides just to make sure um, and then get your cylinder shims accordingly but what we have to do next is we have to do a uh, CC test on the combustion chamber and we don't have the spark plugs yet so um, alright so we're gonna backtrack just for a second we got a little bit ahead of you guys um, tell you what we did I know so you notice we got case savers in here we got studs in here um, if you have a single port a 1600 motor and you're trying to put it into a dual port so let's say you you started out with a single port you can use two of the 40 horse uh, studs in the middle and that gets the right length or you can just have all dual port um, if you have all the dual port studs that'll be correct as well um, but we used on this one we had a we had a set of single port we didn't have any dual port ones we had a set of single port ones uh, 10 millimeter studs and we put in the top uh, where the top ones were from a 40 horse motor that we had laying around for years so you notice we put these in with red loctite and and then after we put them in with red loctite these case savers um, then what we did is then you take that brown stuff here and you cut it on the outside on the, uh, on the threads so and then and then put it in put that put that in afterwards because these go all the way through um, and because they go all the way through they could leak out of that area so you need to make sure you put th put the, the, the on the case savers you want to have the uh, the red loctite and on the studs you want this this stuff here on the studs to make sure it doesn't leak. You know, I noticed I got a com some comments about, uh, there might be somebody who says, we, did we check everything as we put it together? Now, you, you know, check, before we put it together, did we check all the tolerances to make sure everything's been machined correctly? You know, that is your job as an engine builder. You're supposed to make sure that, you know, the machinists did their work right. Now, I mocked up our in-play once, we checked it, and we found out that the, you know, these are the types of things you're gonna run into, like the crankshaft on these, uh, and the one we got was slightly different, or the actually the the flywheel here may have not been machined exactly the same, and it was about ten thousandths uh, 
it had about 10, 10 thousandths too thick. Either you could machine off the crank, which we weren't going to take it all apart, or we could take 10 thousandths off of here because we were going to end up having to use four shims on the back and the Volkswagen requires three shims. So, um, and we were going to be into a really thick tolerance. So if we went ahead and had 10 thousandths taken off of here, out of the inside of here, that was going to tighten things up enough to where we could use a reasonable amount of shims and put it together. So we're going to go ahead and run in play now. We'll check, we'll show you how that works. Okay. You always want to make sure you lube your threads on your, on your nut and on, you know, on where it goes in the crankshaft because you're going to take, especially these crawl molly ones are so, they're so hard um, that you're going to be taking them on and off a few times and you can damage the threads if you don't do that. So one of the things you need to do is, is these have, if you see how these are, these are here, I don't know if I can get it to focus. Um, there's, there's a, one of them has a wider gap and what we do is we, we mark that one and then we mark the flywheel with the same one so that it's easier for us to put on. Go ahead and put it on. And then he marks here on the flywheel. You know, if you mark on the flywheel so that every time you measure it, you're going to be um, measuring at the same place because there always is just a very slight amount of run out on that flywheel. And uh, so with that, we're going to go ahead and run it down with a gun, tighten it. Some of you guys aren't going to have this fancy gauge set up here. Uh, and you can buy these little in play tools. You can use it. This, what this is, is a bolt in place of this. Okay. And then you use a feeler gauge between here in the flywheel and that also works well too so if you guys don't have a in play tool that you know maybe you're not going to be able to afford something this fancy um, these are available also at like carcraft you know, some of the uh, some of the Volkswagen parts places have them yeah if you really want to get creative you can buy one of these go to Harbor Freight Tools they have those dial indicators and you can actually put it on this you can find a way to asphyxiate it onto this and that actually works well too so what's our base here? Go ahead and pull it out. We got it at zero and he pulls it out. You got um, 20, 37, 37, 36, 36, 36 thousandths. Yeah. So what we've got to do is we got to come up with, uh, we want to have between three and five, right? Three and five. Three, five. All right. So we want about three and between three and five um, and, uh, and three and five thousandths. So I'm trying to get back on autofocus three and five thousandths. Um, so we need to you need to do the math real quick and make sure you come up with the right amount of shim stacking and we'll put it together and double check it All right, so we've got three shims you want to have it so you measure three shims and what we do is just stack them up and Measure them with a micrometer. You're gonna need one of those if you're building a motor um, They have them at course at Harbor Freight Tools. We're gonna go ahead and put the flywheel back on we know where it's marked We marked the the same one We're gonna go ahead and put the nut back on afterwards and we're going to tighten it up and recheck it right now. Sometimes you have these things apart three to five times. You just don't know. So don't expect it just to go together the next time you do it. Perfect. All right, so we've checked it. We pushed it in and out. We know we have four thousandths. Um, uh, you guys are skeptics. A four and a half. Yeah, four and a half. Working up. Probably fine right there. And we're going to go ahead and move ahead with that and start putting the, the crankshaft seal on. We'll show you that. So we've uh, STP'd up these things here, the shims. We've cleaned this out here. Get all, make sure you get all the oil out of there. Remember, I told you to oil it before earlier. Um, that's just when you're assembling and taking it back and forth. But when you go to put it together, you want to make sure it's clean and dry. And then we actually took some sandpaper and and kind of uh, smooth this out. What was that? Twelve hundred, some twelve hundred, and just smooth out some of the brand new. You feel them? They're kind of rough. The you know, and here we just smooth that out so that. It's really polished for the seal. We don't want the seal to get ruined. That's a key thing. So if you notice, there's not that stock gasket on here. That's not required with the uh, stroker crank and eight dowel. Uh, we do have the O-ring in here. We took uh, some silicone and just a light little coat of silicone on there just to kind of make sure it's sealed. The seal surface oiled around here and on the face of that. Now, if you're using a used flywheel, a lot of times the, the seal will rub a groove into here. And a lot of times if that groove 
doesn't either either it has to make, meet up exactly with the new seal or be completely in a different place if it's just kind of halfway in it the new seal will leak so if you've ever got a leak on your flywheel it might be because of that um, it's sometimes it's just good I just to put a brand new flywheel because of that reason we've even taken this existing seal and pushed it back further to make sure it's not on that same part of the seal all right so after that go ahead and put some Loctite on your threads here and then a little bit of silicone over the dowel pins sometimes they leak between that washer and the uh, the back there it's it's this part of the video is really important to watch This is when you need to really know your you look at your specs for your for the gland that you're using and the flywheel you have. You know, like if you're using a Cormali flywheel or a regular flywheel, look up some specs on that, get the right one. We've already torqued ours. We're not going to give you our spec, but um, ours is together, and we've also got some grease on these needle bearings. Definitely put that on there before you put the motor in the car. We so we always drop our distributor drive after because if we if we drop it before. It can fool with you when you're doing your end play. Some guys say, well, you do it before. It's it's preference. You can do it now. This is when it was normally done whenever I've built a motor. And so we, we're going to drop it. And one of the things you do is you put it in upside down first. Okay. And what that does is that's going to tell you if it's going to get stuck. If you ever had one get stuck in there, you know, it's a pain because you might have to lift it back out and then go. All right. So we just drop this thing or something in there to center it drop the washer in and use that to center it we also have some STP on that washer to kind of hold it in place it's kind of sticky stuff so then it's down in there already in the right place it's a real pain if that falls in I've had it happen before once so I realized it was pretty hard to see how the distributor was dropped in here and this is how you do this if you have a type 1 you know type 1 and type 2 it goes in like this so that's the wider part here and the narrower part on this side so it kind of lines up with the with the uh, fuel pump like that and then if you have a type 3 then it's supposed to be like to the edge of the second cylinder over second cylinder number two so you know I, I don't know I guess lines up with that stud um, so just keep that in mind you know that, that that's how it's supposed to be done. You couldn't see it, so I wanted to make sure you guys could see it. Also, another thing I'm going to talk to about real quick. So another thing I was going to talk about real quick is we didn't get on camera. Is um, of course we did check the, the the pistons, take them apart, clean them, and we also checked the ring gaps. You know, we just run through the piston and just make sure there's nothing weird, and we also uh, set the rings. So, but the way we set the rings might be different than way the that you guys do it. Uh, we always suggest that you get a, a typical Volkswagen manual, like the one I just showed in the video, um, and use that as reference for a lot of those little things. This is mainly, you know, a difference between a regular motor and a stroker motor. Um, and like I said, you know, a lot of it's by feel because the actual torque specs are going to be different on depending on what part parts you get for your motor. So, stuff like that. So you always drop, you know, we just have a random junk distributor. Uh, this one's not even built put together right um, and we just put it in place just to hold the drive down in place because if you don't have it down in there then when you go to turn it uh, it'll ruin that brass gear down there keep that in mind these are pretty cool pistons they're short in skirts um, they got this whatever it is what is that black stuff called I forget but um, they're actually really nice these AAs are and they work really good Okay, then you set your drink rings however you want. Um, you can go to the book for that, um, for the way to do it. We we have our own way to do it, um, but then the book has its way, so I'm not going to argue. Um, but then these clips, if you notice, they're kind of arc feeling. If you can feel it in your hands, um, you want them to. Let's see, I'm trying to explain this. Um, have the arced part outward, or no, arced part in. inward. So that, okay, so th this one's arced this way, so that the edge is a sharper edge 
that's on that clip, you can feel them in your hand. You can feel, and there's a sharper edge so that it doesn't want to pop out. If you put it this way where it's kind of arced, it's arced like this, okay? If you have it like it arced like that, then those pin, then these, these can actually pop out of place. So on a performance engine, you want it to be so that the it wants to go in instead of out. I don't know, it kind of makes sense when you have it in your hand. So we got the one piston on. The uh, end plate we've already checked. Um, I'll tell you about that in a second. By the way, we did take these all apart and actually clean uh, pistons. Some guys actually sand the edge of the piston. Uh, I was talking to some of the racers about that. They just said that's mainly be to lower your CC limit. Um, but it's really not necessary. We, we've been running them like this and never had a problem. These are these are not machine, sanding them. Yeah, these are already beveled. These already but these are already beveled. If you look at the, these are already done. So they're actually done really nice. Some guys like to sand that and make it rounded. You know that's not really a hundred percent necessary. The arrow pointed towards the flywheel. We'll go ahead and slide that barrel on. Let me get it. Can I get one hand free here? He's got it. Better if I just let him do it. Slide them on. It's nice. You have these real ring compressors. The Volkswagen specific ones are nice. I've even done it with the other style ones. Uh, another one. and, and we also have silicone on the barrel if you just thought that squirt out. And you would have your cylinder shims on if you had any. We did check our in play or our, our deck height. And uh, I'll just give you what, what this is what I found out from other guys um, that build these things all the time, what, what our old school uh, uh, stuff was. And again, this is a stroker engine, so you might have a little bit different type of opinions on this stuff. But a deck height, um, from what from what the original specs were, was typically 60 thousandths um, was a good deck height. And we're right at 58 thousandths on this motor. So um, we didn't need to have shims. Um, typically if you can get more of your fire to fire in the cylinder head than in the, than in the barrel, um, that's going to reduce your detonation. So some guys are even, you know, running their, running their pistons all the way up tight and then they're putting in like a head gasket around the head. So from what I understand, the lowest you should have on a street motor is 45. Okay, the lowest, and that's really, really tight. Um, so 45 is the lowest. I wouldn't even get near that number. Um, but 50, uh, 50 to 50, between 50 and 60 is okay. Even if you wanted to go up a little bit higher than that, to some guys are going, and they say up to 70 thousandths is a good deck height. I've even seen guys put together with 90 thousandths um, deck height. But again, if you're getting too much fire in your barrel and not in your cylinder head, you're not doing yourself any favors. Um, having more fire in that cylinder head is going to be your friend. It's going to be less, less, uh, less uh, stuff. So, on our on our old motors back years ago, when we were running them low compression, uh, we were selling a lot of motors in the in the in the shop I worked at. They would step cut this, so they would cut like a they would leave like about an eighth of an inch or less around the edge of the barrel, and they would step cut another cut in here. To make make the combat busting chambers bigger because we wanted to keep them without having cylinder shims and then still having more more fire in the head so it's a little game you play again you can do that at your own risk and your own reference um, and, and if you don't like my data you know you can comment that and you you can use it or not use it it's all up to you carefully tap them in of course, you know you got the pin. This side is going to have the clip on it so that you can push that pin in place. And make sure it's on there. And make sure that it's on there good. And make sure that the clips are all on. The You can't spend enough time. You can't spend too much time getting the clips on. You just make sure they are right. That they are on, seated all the way around. You do not want your piston clips to fall off. So... I'm going to bring you guys back in the video in a minute. We're going to go ahead and assemble this whole top end and get it all ready for the heads. And we'll put those on, bring you back in in a minute. Uh, there's no sense in you watching me do every piston. It's basically repetitive. The base same thing on both sides.
All right, Chris said I did something wrong. What's wrong with this picture? Oh, yeah. I think I know what's wrong. What do you guys think? What's wrong with that? I was putting this one on, and he says it's not right. Okay. All right, so I'm going to show you guys about the pressure relief stuff. Um, this is how this is assembled here. Um, and it, if you get one of these kits, you know, the pressure relief kits, you know, that has this kind of piston here versus the original ones were just two of these, I believe, something like that. Um, you're going to be short one washer, so make sure you have uh, one of the original washers and the plugs. Because if you buy the new block, they do not come with this, any of this stuff. So we're going to go ahead and put these in. Let's check it out. Assembly lube. All right, then you drop that one in. So that one goes in the rear of the block towards the rear of the car. This one goes in the front, like that. I put oil in the holes already. We put, there's already oil in the holes. It's already lubed. If you didn't hear him say that. It drops them in place. I mean, sometimes you get these old ones. Some of the old cases you'll have, like, uh, burred up and stuff. That's why it's so nice. These new aluminum cases are very well made. And, you know, haven't had too many problems with that stuff. So you put the tall spring in the back of the engine, short spring in the front. And if you want to look up on like, uh, there's a, a websites out there that show how they what they actually do, um, and it, it's something about you know not giving all the oil to the oil cooler when it's cold, giving more to the engine. And then as it warms up, it starts to put more through the oil cooler. So that's what the design is. I believe. That's what I, if I remember right. But, you know, I'm going to go check out one of those charts. If you're curious about that. You can use a hammer and chisel to tighten that up if you want. See how he's doing not, here? Not too hard. Just enough. Though. Just enough. This is an aluminum case. So it's going to be a little bit stronger than a mag. If you did mag, you better not do it that tight. <laughs> that's my favorite one right here. And this one's always fun with the long spring a ling, -a -ling. It's more fun you're doing underneath the yeah. car. It's really fun, yeah. When you're doing it underneath the car, don't you love that? My favorite. God, man. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> oh. Yeah, lost the spring. <laughs> Boom. Maybe did it hit the ceiling? I don't know where it was. I think it went over here. <laughs> you guys see it? I don't see it. It's in the scrap pile. Oh, I heard it hit the ground. Oh, here's the spring. Ta-da. There it is. There's a spring. Uh, I thought he lost the cap too, but just the spring. So it's kind of a little hard to do. Sometimes you can like put a socket on the end of there and just kind of use it to hold it. I've done that before. Like just use a, you know, use a socket and just use the, let the teeth, the socket kind of hold it. But uh, these things are a pain, especially with these new springs. They're really, really stiff. Screen. Let's lock down the engine stand. We did put the heads on just temporarily uh, because we may not get to our push rods today. So we didn't want our uh, our glue to set up without um, having some tension on it. So a little trick there. There you go. Alright. So we got these in here. Got, there's a lot of extra stuff we're putting on this motor. We're going to have to pull this. Uh, we forgot to long stud this. So, so we're going to have to... We have a special wrench to get that off. Put along side there for the extra deep sump. And what's kind of cool, we we might be figuring we don't know yet. We're going to check this out, um, but we'll bring, probably bring you guys that back in the video once we figure it out. Um, because there's a lot of figuring on your push rods, so uh, we got the cut to fit ones. Because sometimes you end up with odd, you know, deck height stuff, and you end up with a lot of shims. And since we ended up with no shims. Um, I'm thinking that we will end up with, um, so these are 5.4 rods we got in here, 5.4s. 5. 5. 5. So since we put the 5.4s on, it kind of compensated just enough and made up for the stroke and made it so it was, um, so that we just have to put no shims in this. So that's not very often. This kind of a nice little motor combination. If you're building one of these and you get all those same parts, you might be pretty close to that. That would be kind of cool you know, with these heads, the CCs. We did CC these. We're going to show that in a little while. We're going to come back into that. Um, but um, 
we did CC these already, and we're going to be, we figure, based on the CCs and the deck height, at about eight and a quarter to one, which is perfect for the camshaft and everything we got in here. Um, you, the, what I was going to say is, um, so we put these on here temporarily. What we were thinking would be like kind of neat is we might end up with stock push rod length because one of the things that's a pain when you build a stroker engine is the shortening of the push rods or lengthening the push rods. Um, usually it's lengthening and it's it's kind of a pain to do. So we're going to try a stock push rod in here and see if it works, kind of mock it up. And then we're going to put on these cool tin things. We're gonna, so we're going to have a video on just putting on the cool tin. So you guys that then you guys will know how to do it the quote unquote right way. Because <laughs> one guy says, oh, if you don't do it the quote unquote right way, then there's no point in putting them on. It's like, well, who would do it the wrong way? Okay. Well, anyway, we're bringing you back to the video in a little bit. Okay, so we did our mock-up of the uh, valve train, and we were thinking we can go with uh, stock push rods, but we can't. So I'm going to explain to you guys a little bit about how that you do this. Um, we're using a dial indicator, um, and, you know, the, the best way to use it is to put the dial indicator because what we're going to do is we have to find uh, the middle of, so so it, because we have a performance cam, and this is something you always have to do with the, with a larger performance cam, it's, you know, a really mild one may not be that bit, much difference, but you should always check this. Um, so the height right here of your push of your uh, of your rocker arm assembly in the, in the length of your push rod needs may need to be adjusted. So what you want is when it is right in the middle of so when the valve is uh, not depressed at all and when it's fully depressed, you need to determine what the middle of that is. So what we do is we use the dial indicator and then we rotate the engine over we already know what the number is ours is so it goes down you watch how many times it goes around so it goes around once two three four and then you'll see it start to come back up so then right there that's the bottom okay so then we go halfway so we know it's four and what 20 yeah we'll say 420 420 so right at 210 so we'll set it up at 210. We'll go right to 210. And that's the middle. Two ten. Okay, you could use you could get one of these little dial indicators at Harbor Freight and maybe a little make a little mock up if you want. It's not hard to do. And two twenty so two twenty. So it was two forty before, right? And so at two twenty, um, this thing should be a perfectly straight line down the valve and right there is where it's a straight line you see so what we have to do is we have to space this thing up enough and then cut our put make up push rods the right length so that this thing is a nice straight line in this between the fully um, uh, depressed valve and the fully released valve okay so it should be a straight line just like that and it's not it's actually kind of at an angle so that's what you need to look at our, our, we're about right here okay if you can see it's not a straight line it looks like a okay it looks like that okay so we have to make our valve train by raising this so many with a bunch of shims okay so it's the right length and then uh, make our push rods to fit accordingly so this is where it becomes a little bit you know challenging if you're a brand new motor builder uh, you can't just bolt parts on you know you got to do go through and check all this stuff um, and so we got these uh, they have these two different types of push rods they have these ones that are adjustable push rods like this these are chromoly too right yeah, yeah I these are chromoly and these are adjustable push rods yeah, you can make them it's not hard just use a six millimeter stud and just tap it and put it you, yeah what you do is you, you, this is this is what we use we use this tool to make the push rod so um we, we just take a six millimeter stud you know six millimeter piece of all thread and then tap each end of it and then put a nut on here and then we use that to make the push rod length we need okay as a tool and then once we get that push rod length we're going to make a full set to 
onto these cut to fits. So you have these here where they got to be cut to fit. Okay. So we'll so once we come up with our length, we'll we'll make a matching set of chromoly push rods from this cut to fit set we we showed you earlier in the other bit video that had the so we weren't sure if we were going to have to do this. We were hoping we weren't going to have to, but cuz it does take a lot of time, you know. But, um, you, you know, it's, it's something that you kind of, we can watch this part a couple times over and you probably get it. Also, JBugs has a video on their, um, on their, uh, website. website and, I think and I think they have their own YouTube and it shows how to do this a little bit easier. So you can watch theirs. You've watched ours. Uh, maybe all that to put together and you'll be able to figure out how to get yourself through this. And like I said, you can buy, you can just mock up something. Look at, I mean, this is just put on there with, these uh, clamps and uh, you know the, the same dial indicator we I think we used for the uh, for the in play you know and just kind of clamped it on there to hold it in place and then you can get this dial indicator at, at Harbor Freight and and do this yourself it's really not hard to do so you you know might be a thing to buy you know they're not even that expensive over there and they, they work pretty good so anyway that's how you do the 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 push rod length set up and then once we get that done we'll just go ahead and assemble it uh, we probably won't show us cutting all the individual things it's just kind of repetitive and long term but i think hope that helps you get figure out what you need to do all right all right so we got the push rod tubes on this motor what's cool is because it didn't require a lot of spacing uh, it's kind of a little bit of a gamble you don't always know exactly how much spacing you're going to need um, we can use these stock push rod tubes because they're a lot easier to deal with than the others. So you stretch them back, you put your, uh, these are actually silicone, the new ones, I mean the, that's the better style. So you stretch them out a little bit, and put them on there, like again, like I said, then again, these are so much easier to use than the, the other style. Um, sometimes you'll end up having to get these spring loaded ones like this. We have these scat ones, which are probably one of the best ones. They're a little harder to put together. You know, they're spring loaded, so it's a pain in the butt to put the head on. So fortunately we don't have to use those. So now we've got our test push rod right here. We've already figured this is our length we need. Because uh, again, like you, you, to make those again, all you can do is just thread, take one of the push, regular push rod, thread it, put some all thread in there, and put a nut on there to make it so you can set it to place. Um, tap it, you know, tap it and put all thread in there. And you just that's how you make that yourself. And then what we're using is one of these. We got two different cutters from Harbor Freight. We got this one, and we bought this style one. Um, we're thinking maybe this one's going to be easier to use because it has a little more leverage and we really want a nice cut accurate cut to the right length so using a tubing cutter is really the way to go um, versus using if you're going to use a hacksaw or something like that you're going to have to you know grind them you know, hacksaw them longer and then grind them perfect so that they are perfectly cut um, because, uh, you know, we're talking about 30 thousandths thickness that we're going to have to put in our shims. So, you know, if you're 10 thousandths off, that's going to make a significant difference. So you need a really good, accurate cut on these. So, anyway, we'll go, we're not going to put that all in the video, but we'll bring you guys back in a little bit later and uh, show you guys where we're at. All right, so we're going to cut these away, show you guys a little bit about how that works so you kind of get that deal and so we're going to cut one you know cut it away you have to turn it keep cutting a little bit you know, like that little cutter just cuts away at it if you ever use one of these if you never use one there it is a chromoly it cuts through that pretty quick i was surprised these are chromoly push rods um cut to fit so and then what you do is you take the ends. Just make sure they're the right length. Make sure that's the right length. You know, check it with this marked one. Perfect. Pull some of those in a second. And then um, we'll put the ends on in a second. We'll show you. 
So you take the inside, clean it out with a little file, just to kind of make sure it's no burr inside there. We're just going to heat it up just a little bit. Don't get it too hot. You're not trying to melt it or, you know, just trying to open up the lifter or the, the push rod a little bit. And we drop it into a lifter, an old lifter, not your new ones. And then uh, carefully just kind of tap them onto place like that. And then it's a nice press fit. That's how you do it. Putting the heads on. We're going to show you guys how to put these cool tin on here um, on the other side. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll be doing that in the next portion here. See how we're putting these all on. Uh, okay, I guess we'll probably do a little parts run. Yeah, that's something else we need. Um, and then we'll get this all together. And we got our stuff all shimmed and so we're just going to go ahead and put the push rods in this side, I think. And then we'll, uh, right now we're torquing the heads. Are they 20? I'm just doing an initial Oh, torque. just doing a small a portion torque. Just run through and just kind of bring them down slow. Because you want your, you know, collapsing your push rods and some of that stuff. So just run through them and kind of just tighten them up a little bit. After we get them all... Uh, you know, just kind of get them down so they're snug. Then we start torquing them down. You do like two different sets of torques on them. We'll bring you back to the end of the video in just a minute. Do just a little bit. Keep making the seal. Okay. Oh. So we've got the um, the other side off. We just took the cylinder head off the other side. We just did a... He likes to do like a, 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 a one tightening on the one side, especially on a mag case. This really makes a difference. We do like part, partial tightening over here, and then you do like a... Partial tightening over here, then go back to the other side and do maybe your full tightening or another partial tightening and then another partial tightening. So that on a, especially on a mag case, because they're so uh, not so strong, is it just brings it out nice and slow, um, especially in a brand new motor. I mean, if you have an old one that's been running for a while, you know, you can do one at a time. But when it's brand new, you know, because everything's so tight, you want to make sure that there's not going to be an issue. So we're going to show you how to do cool tin, how to actually install them. I use this thing a hole in the tin so we're going to punch holes in the tin and I'll show you what they're for I'm going to put one right here uh, one right here just two on each side mm -hmm. it's a lot faster than drilling you can drill kind of a neat tool you have these at Harbor Freight 40 bucks So normally underneath your cylinders you have, uh, on your type 1, you have one of these type of things. And what they have is, uh, on type 3's they have this type of a cooling system. And some people will say that it, this does not make it run cooler, but it actually does. And I'm going to explain this to you real quick. Again, even though I've explained this before, uh, because somebody might be a brand new person watching. So you guys who have already seen this, uh, please be patient for a minute or you can fast forward a little bit. Um, but what these actually do is they replace the, those those deflector shields that go, these normally go between the two cylinders here underneath the engine, okay? And the problem with these is they do work, uh, but what they, they miss like this portion right here of the cylinder. So um, usually when you'll see, when you'll see, uh, and, and right here, over here, a little bit on this side, so usually what you'll see on an engine, you know, this is the number three side too. So usually what you'll see is if you have a, a, a bad piston, it's usually going to be burned through right in here. Correct. Right, right, right here. And so that's uh, right here. Or if it was on this one, it'd be right here where the studs are. So what this does is it actually goes underneath the cylinder tin. And uh, goes like this. Let me just put that on there. We'll just mock it up right now. So they can be a little bit of a challenge, especially with you know, 10 millimeter studs. I think they were designed for eights. So um, this case is a little bit thick. So you're going to have to do sometimes a little bit of trimming to get them to fit, uh, you know, and, but, and you can a little bit of bending. So like that, to, but it does take a little bit of time. So we'll get it on here and, and we'll show you what it's like on there. So then through your holes, 
we um, actually on this side you notice we put them on in advance in the back um, and twisted them and covered them because this one here is really covered by the case and then just make sure they're on there really good and tight and you put the put this through your cylinders here and then run it back through let's look at the other side and then thread them through like that so it's much easier to do this when you have your engine if it's out of the car it's in the car it can be really pain in the butt and when you're building the engine it's much easier to do so these need to be really tightly up against here I noticed it already popped loose I'll bring you back in the video in a second. Then you, so then you just go ahead and wire them in so that they're on there really nice and tight. Uh, around your studs, around like this, and then so that there's no way they can fall out. You don't want them to get, you don't want any air between the cylinders escaping. Um, it should come. You want everything to come out these metered holes. And so, what these do that's better than the other again is what they do is there's two different things. They meter the air that comes through your cylinders. It takes, make sure it, that all the air is, none of it's wasted. It all has to go through these holes, okay? And what that does is that gives it the maximum amount of, um, it gives them the maximum amount of, of cooling, you know, and no wasted air um, going around your cylinders. So there's no part of your cylinder that's, that's, that's not getting air. And the second thing that it does is it, because it meters the proper amount of air going through here, it allows more air, air to go through your heads and also helps air to go all the way around the combustion chamber of your head here and go out just this area and go out the back of the car. Um, now, we'll show the cylinder uh, cylinder tin on there so you can see what it's kind of more, a little bit what it's like, um, and then we'll just talk a little more about that. See it. Okay, so now you can really see what they do when I get down here um, you can see it just there's no before you would have a gap right here okay and you'd have this normal vertical small piece of tin that goes down right here I would say probably 80% of the cars I've seen that is missing because people took it off and didn't put it back on um, you don't totally need that now um, so if you can deal with these small holes here um, and the back tin on yours um, will just overlap and set there it, and, and it doesn't bother you um, you don't totally need those you can actually still put them on but you may have to bend them a little bit um, so they're not just gonna bolt right on and you notice if you it's just like if you get you know some of the Chinese tin or some of the uh, I don't know Brazilian tin or whatever and try to put on a German tin it doesn't fit quite right you have to kind of tweak everything you can get them to work, but you don't totally need those anymore. You could actually put nut and washer if you wanted to here, and that'll probably settle it. Because what that piece of tin was for, that was here, was to kind of catch some more, so that the air would kind of go want to go downward and not just go outward right here, so that uh, you would you wouldn't have like a bigger gap. That's what that little tin was for to work with the other def uh, deflector plates underneath. So since you have this, now you notice that this goes to the head and brings the air down. Um, they're really, you know, people, and, and people will say that, uh, you know, that there was a bullet out on VW, and I, I don't doubt there wasn't, uh, that v Volkswagen said that this kind of tin on a Type 1 won't work. It doesn't help cool it. Um, it's basically, it was an insurance policy for them to not get sued um, because if they did say that they did work then they would basically be saying that their engineering was wrong and do you think they're ever going to say that no they won't say that so this is how the cool tin are installed and this is what they do um, they're available again at carcraft they're called either type 3 engine tin or sometimes they're known as cool tin back in the old days you were called cool tin they're probably just if you tell them you want type 3 deflector um, deflector plates for underneath your cylinders I'll know what you're talking about and you can order these I'll put a link in the video and uh, it does help cool your engine it actually we found that it really does work give you uh, 
better temperature if they're installed correctly and you wire them in like this here. If you don't have the wire and pulling them up tight and they fall loose, that's when people have problems and that's why people say they don't work. Um, even some of the old school guys said, yeah, they, they don't work. One of the guys, Bob Hoover or something like that says, they don't work. And then he says, well, they work only if you install them correctly. Well, when are you going to, you know, <laughs> when are you going to say that they, he says they don't work and the people, you know, and then he says, but they only work if you install them correctly and nobody installs them correctly. And it's like, okay, well, just install them correctly. Then you won't have a problem. So anyway, yeah, we found uh, several degrees of cooler, you know, of cooler temperature, engine to head, head temperature just from this and also cylinder temperature lower. I did buy one of those temperature laser things. So we'll be showing some of that later in other videos coming up. I'll be talking to you guys in the next one. And uh, this is going to end this video, this particular, but it's also going to continue the engine build. So if you're watching the engine build, stay tuned. Um, this is going to end this particular portion of the video. Good, we're going to put this up separately. All right, so we're going to put in the push rod tubes. Just a little light coat. Yeah, we're going to put some of this, put the wonderful brown goop. I hope you guys enjoy using that stuff. Because <laughs> I don't. I love it. it. Smells like sawdust. Yeah, it's just like. I don't know. I used to put them in dry years ago. But I guess this works too. Hang on, this one's bent. Yeah, it's our like, tin just works great. Well, they do is they take a push rod to hold it in place. Yeah, you just use a push rod, prop it in the hole. Hit them with the brown stuff again. Ooh. Just a little bit. Yeah. Stick it in the hole. Drop in the push rod. Get a little brown. Stuff this is make sure this is like uh, the number two that doesn't dry. The number one, I think, is the yeah, stuff that is, dries. This is the Forma Gasket Aviation. Yeah. Aviation Forma Gasket. Permatex sells it. You know. Sticky and gross, but it it's seals cheap. Up pretty good. What I normally do I think is it's very we'll, expensive to we'll buy. Take a, we'll take a brand new container and we'll leave it cracked open for a week <laughs> so it thickens up. Yeah. This stuff's, this stuff's like piss water, man. It's terrible. Yeah, that's so When you thicken it up, though, it actually works very well. Yeah, hard. this stuff's really, really thin. I'm used to it thicker, too. I think I all mine are so old that. Yeah, and those are the best ones. Those are the ones I had, you know, like I used to have when it was like 10, 5, 10 years old. It lasts forever. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, then I didn't do VWs for a while, so I didn't keep that around. I probably chucked it at some point. Don't remember. You just drop your heads in. So then make sure after we yeah. get everything here. We kind of play around with it, make sure that they, that's why these are a lot easier to do than the spring-loaded ones are a real pain. So if you can get your motor specs just right like we were really fortunate with that if you go with go with the same parts that we have on this video you probably will be pretty close to where we at within you know 10 or 20 thousandths so who knows all right you should make sure you get all the seams facing upwards too because that'll keep them from leaking if they start to go bad yeah and then again we are five thousandths off one side to the other um and we're not worried about that some guys will get freaked out about that. Oh my God, you should have the block deck, all this stuff. We're not racing. We, this is just an engine to drive, and it really won't make that much difference in the total compression mm -hmm. or CECCs. Um, so yeah, you just set them in there that way. And then, oh, what's the next step? All right, so then we just put the brown crap again and run, run all the ones on the inside of the valve cover. Of course, these side are the air side. Really no need to put the brown stuff over here. Um, it's not really a doesn't really lock the threads or anything like that. We're just you know, it's mainly just to in case around that uh, you know there might be some leakage or something. You can get a very small oil leak from that. You know who wants any oil leaks, right? Is that the whole idea? And you just run them down, uh, run through them. You know, just get them snug. Just. Don't even get them really snug. Just start to bring them down little by little, and just kind of work your head down. You know, you are pushing the collapsing the push rod tubes as you go. Because remember, I, earlier I stretched them and put the uh, 
things on them there and twist them a little bit, check them. You know, make sure they're make sure they're not like going crooked. You want to make sure that they don't you know do any of that stuff. If you got a crooked push rod tube, it, what'll happen is your 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 push rod will actually rub against it. So what I do is and, just get a ratchet in also. Yeah. And just kind of can do that to them. them around a little bit to kind of center them up. Make sure they're centered. You, you do not want one that's crooked. Because the edge of it can rub, rub on the push rod. Yep. And damage that. Well, it'll damage. It'll the... damage the push. Not just damage the push rod, but it'll cause a leak. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll actually rub through. They're very thin metal. So. Anyway, that's pretty much it for that portion. I think we'll bring you guys back in a little bit later. Yeah, I would say you know use your book and your torque specs uh, from your book for your heads. Remember, this is an aluminum case, so probably the the highest amount of torque that they would allow, you know, if, would be probably okay. And make sure you do it to the normal, you know, whatever it is. I think it's what 24 pounds, to, you know, something like that. 23 for the heads for. for yeah. 10 millimeters and 18 for the 8 millimeters, but I always do yeah. 24 on the tones. You can do 24 on the on the heads, no problem. It's an aluminum case. It's, we're engineered different than the original, so you don't really need more than that, though. People think they want to tighten it more, but there's no no real necessary need. All right, so I'll bring you guys back in the video um, a little bit later, and we will check that out when we get to the valve adjustment. All right, since we have the Cremoli push rods in here, um, we always this is how we normally do it, and you can do whatever you want. If you don't want to put them at that, you can put them at six thousandths. But I'm going to tell you, if you put them at six, you're going to have a really noisy motor. It's going to be clacky like crazy because of the push. Corona push rods make a really loud uh, clacking noise. So, because they don't have the same uh, resistance that the, or they don't have the same you know expansion contraction of the aluminum. Um, and so they, they actually work fine, we found, if you put them at zero, which there's a way to do that. Um, or some guys run them at two thousands. So you can, you can decide what you want to do. But what we do is uh, we tighten it down. Wait, is this one ready? Either one. Oh, what's one? Either one. Yeah. So we tighten it down here, and you'll feel it like, you'll feel a little bit of like, movement okay you tighten a little bit more and all of a sudden you'll feel it to where it just stops and there's no movement but you can also still freely twist the push rod around so if you feel here you feel it's like there's there's some you can get that push rod to spin really easily um then that's uh i don't think you can see it but anyway you can make sure that push rod spinning and then tighten it right there and then double check it um, again, like I said, that's our, that's preference. This is a preference thing. Uh, if you run them at six, it's going to be super noisy. You know, the typical is six thousandths. And then we do them, tighten them up, check them, make sure they spin, you know, and make sure they spin freely, very freely. So it's almost, because a two thousandths feeler gauge is so thin, it's like a wafer, you know, so it's almost like you could do a feel and uh, you'd probably be about the same place you were about 2000 so running them at six is like just like i've done it before and it's just like really noisy just clacky and he's got the fancy tool you can see that you can do this with a wrench though you don't need to have that just a regular wrench and a screwdriver but this here you know has a screwdriver and a wrench all together you can see the screwdriver inside pretty cool all right so anyway, um, I think that's going to wrap it up for this video on this portion. Um, remember, the next one's going to be very important to a lot of people are going to go, oh, I can dress my motor, I can put all the tin on it. Yeah, okay, but there's certain things that you have to do. Like, one of the things you have to do is you have to put on a breather kit. If you run a, anything larger than a 1776, and even some of those, if you're running really high RPMs, they need a breather kit. So uh, we're going to put on the breather kit. We're going to show you what that is. Um, we're going to have, uh, and we're going to show you how to, to set up the oil cooler and all that stuff and the uh, uh, oil filter, which, and also the extra sump. Oh, I forgot to get the uh, long, we need longer uh, studs for the, uh, for the oil, for the extra sump, extra oil sump. 
So we still have that to do. Um, that'll be in the next video, and we're going to go ahead and wrap this one up on this. And we're still sandblasting our valve covers, but we'll go ahead and put those on as soon as we get those done and cleaned and painted. And uh, we want to keep it clean over the weekend and let you guys check all this stuff out. Well, I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you when we're done. All right, guys. Uh, welcome back again on this uh, engine build or bulletproof engine build. I don't think it really is such really quite a thing as bulletproof when it talks to Volkswagen, but, but as close as you can get. Um, and one of the things you got to do with these, um, uh, one of the things I want to back up for a second, uh, one of the things we realized that we are going to, we, we change on our engine real quick is on our, on, we actually didn't show you guys this, that we changed that. Um, we pulled out the front plug here and took out the, 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 what is it? I guess it's a, for the relief piston with a the high pressure kit. Um, you don't really need that with the, uh, full flow, full flow system. Um, uh, apparently, we, I don't know, we weren't really thinking about that when we put it together. And, uh, somebody actually also corrected us on the video, but, um, we've already, you know, we are, we were already in route of changing that back, um, before we even, before, um, he was already in route of it. I wasn't sure, um, as I don't usually make full flow motors. So back in the old days, this was a very rare thing that we did. Um, this is more of a recent engine thing in the last 10 years or 20 years. Okay. Uh, the next thing we do is we have to take the old, the new tin and we have to fit it to the engine block. So plan on taking some time. It's not like you can just bolt the stuff back on again. Um, you're going to have to do some things like if you notice here, this is rounded so that it fits correctly on the new engine block. Um, some of these, I don't know what we modified on these. I don't think we did. I don't think we did much to the cylinder tin. We fit them on and checked them. Just trim. Uh, Just trim the back edge on. Oh yeah, the back edge, that's right. I remember there was something. Uh, it, where it, where, because the cases are so much thicker than the old mag. Um, because it's also, it's, it's stronger, thicker, and uh, stronger material. So, uh, but we have, you have to fit all the engine tin on. So you want to make sure you mock it all up. Um, it takes a bit of time to do, and then uh, put it on. We did weld our, our uh, oil pump gear and tested it after it was welded and then installed it. Like I was showing you, if you watched the oil pump video, um, I was just talking about putting a little tack weld on there. You don't want to use a lot of heat. Uh, I had one other guy comment that, you can't do that, it'll mess up, this and that. It's like, no, it's, you don't use that much heat. You use enough heat to do to make it so it'll stay. But we actually have seen two, two engines with exactly that problem. One got sent all the way to Sacramento and from from Riverside and uh, wasn't our, one of our engines, but it was another guy's and he sent it back all the way to Riverside again and checked it. We had very, very low oil pressure and what it was is the gear was actually spinning on the shaft. Happens, does work, it does happen. And it's happened twice. So that's why we started welding that gear. So make sure uh, if you want that insurance, make sure you do that on yours if you want. But anyway, we're fitting all the engine tin and we'll be putting that on here. We'll be showing that in a little while and then we'll talk to you in the next portion here. All right, so we got the old engine out. Um, this engine was actually uh, set to be just in this bus temporarily uh, when I first built it. 
it just came out of another bus that I sold and they wanted a new engine so I just shoved it in there and then some of the stuff I never got really rigged up right or set up right uh, so there was some funky stuff like this fuel filter here where it's at um, I never put a fuel filter there because it can potentially do this and that's what it's done before of course it didn't hurt it didn't burn anything on it but you know that's just not the way I usually do stuff so that stuff is uh is somebody else's stuff it was just I just shoved it in here to make it move and then what happened is it got moved around then it started running then we did stuff and we didn't really you know set this thing up correctly so anyway the uh so we got the motor out uh the things that we need to do is we need to do now is we need to take off some of the parts that we're going to use on the new one and there's a lot of stuff that we did to this one which i'll kind of update you guys on now um since we're here uh, uh we had to mock this whole thing up we had to put the uh tin on because we had to put our breather kit on i'll talk to you guys about what a breather kit is i'll show you a little bit more about that a little bit later we had to mock that all up put holes in here for the hoses for it and uh, all that stuff we still have to do a lot of fabrication stuff for the hoses for the oil cooler um, one of the things we, I never understood about buses is they always have these slip-on clamps or uh, b bugs and buses it was kind of an archaic thing you know I always thought that was just crazy so what you can buy is what we're gonna put on here is these flanges like this you can buy these at Carcraft um, maybe I'll put these in the video and if I don't put it in there make sure you make a comment on that make a comment anyway um, I always like to see those comments it really helps the video so um, but yeah, we're gonna put these on the exhaust so that it, it it gets eliminates this crappy design clamp sorry I had you guys out of the video um, they eliminates this crappy design clamp which always ends up like this and this thing it had a nice little exhaust leak it was a little ticker ticker while you're driving down the road. So uh, there's just a couple things we're gonna transfer over. Peter, we're gonna put heater boxes on this because I'm planning on running the heater. I don't know, I might be somewhere where I need it. So I don't know, you know, so I'm gonna run, probably run this exhaust. We're gonna try it out. Um, it's probably not the best exhaust for this van. I mean, for that engine. But we're going to try it out and see how it goes. Um, we may not be port matched to our exhaust. We're going to take a look at that when we get it apart. Um, there's a lot of little things we're going to transfer over. Um, and some guys go, hey, you can't fit a one of these type of fuel pumps on with a alternator. Looks like it happened. So it can be done. Um, so or you just, you just have to loosen it up and lift it up sometimes to get it on there. It's just a little bit of a pain, but it does work. Um, so we're going to put this distributor in it. You know, this is a, a Bosch coil. It doesn't look like it, but it is. It's, you can see the labels in the back. Um, so we're going to put all this stuff on, and we're going to transfer a bunch of stuff over and clean up what we got here. I think we're going to reuse this re rear tin, clean it up in the sandblaster, and repaint it and all that. So we'll bring you guys back in the video uh, a little bit later and show you what's, what's going on with that. All right. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to get all the little details of stuff um, as we were doing it because it was just too much fabrication and stuff like that. Um, and I, But I'm going to walk around some of the stuff with you guys now. Uh, we had to remove some of the parts from the other motor or other engine. One guy said, well, it's not a motor, it's an engine. It's like, well, that's true. But, you know, guys just call them motors sometimes. You know, some of the, but they're not really motors. We know that. It's just a slang word. So anyway, uh, let's take a look at what, well, what we did and stuff and you know, typically the wires go in these little hole. They have these little things that go in there. Um, we didn't happen to have any of those. But I'll show you this way to do these. The way not to do them is just to tie them together. If you tie them together with zip ties, what you can end up with is an inductive fire. Um, so if you see here, there's a zip tie covering the two wires and there's one to keep them spaced. So that um, you just wrap another zip tie around the middle. And that keeps them space, so it makes makes them look look nice or whatever. If you want to do it that way, that might be some idea for some of you guys. Uh, but you can do whatever you want. Again, like like I said, all the stuff in my video is my opinions, not stuff that it's not you know the God sent rule book to everything for sure. Um, you guys do whatever you want to do. 
Um, one of the things we do is we have a screw in oil pressure gauge so you can watch it while it's running. Um, we do not want to install it in the van until after we run it to the break in time. So we put the screw in gauge in there. It's just basically a regular pre uh, pressure oil pressure gauge that you buy in one of those ones and it has the proper threads typically to go right into the hole there it's a pipe thread so make sure you don't tighten it too tight because it is a pipe thread like one of the guys said don't tighten up the sensor all the way till it stops for sure that's definitely do not do that <laughs> um so we got the point of this distributor in here you guys do the timing still uh, we did uh, have the carb rebuilt. Um, there are I, I, you guys that are looking at this. I, you know, a lot of the stuff has changed. Uh, there are two different types of setups on these two barrels. Um, the early ones were the 20, 26, 27s, like what the one I have. The later ones were the 30, 34. So if you're trying to do the 1600 bot, I would not buy the the bigger one. I think they're too big. It's like flushing the toilet when you hit secondary. It's just too much for the car. So, I, I, you know, this one here um, is the better one, I think. I think this, this engine would probably run with the bigger carb just fine. But the smaller one, mm, not really. So, uh, the smaller one for the smaller, for the smaller engines, those don't work very well. So, that's what I think. I don't know. I haven't tuned one. I haven't tried. But all that stuff's all changed. You know, things that guys are old school guys. You know, so we got the clamp here set up. Uh, and then these are the this is the breather kit so anytime you have more than a higher revving engine or you have a you know seven the bigger than a 1776 uh, we found that you pretty much are needing a breather kit hooked up to your engine so uh, we don't have the back tin on here right now but there's holes in it already you see here cut holes in there one of these stair step drill bits from Harbor Freight, like this, is kind of handy to do a lot of that stuff. They're very cheap. Uh, you make these and then grind them out. And what this will do is this will go back here after we get the engine in there. When we get ready to put it in the vehicle, then the hoses will actually go through these holes here to the valve covers. And what these breather kits do is because you have so much more, you know, larger pistons and you have more stroke and you have more air movement inside the engine is to keep it from building up crankcase pressure and when it builds up too much crankcase pressure what happens is you all start pissing oil out of about everywhere it can find a spot to piss out if you don't have one of these so if you have a a larger engine in your car you don't have these on there and it's leaking oil maybe that's why um, so I want to get a breather kit so these go up here and it kind of neutralizes into here and one of these little boxes, it comes with these boxes and these hoses here. And they go to the two valve covers, and then it also goes to your normal um, uh, uh, positive crankcase current ventilation and your road draft tube here. So that's all part of it. Um, these alternators that we got here are Chinese made. Uh, the old ones back in the old days were made by Motorola, which were, I think, probably better. I very rarely ever saw a Motorola that, that ever went bad. The Chinese ones, uh, I think, probably better than the uh, most of the generators out there. I'm not going to say all of them. Maybe the Bosch one would be better. I'm not sure. I just, they're so expensive. You know, this is what you end up with. It. You kind of run into the to the brick wall, you know. Everybody goes, "Well, all German parts, put all German parts on it," and it's like, it's a brick wall now. And a lot of the German parts are not like the old German parts. So, you guys that are not currently in the Volkswagen thing, you're kind of watching the videos just to see um, the new German parts are a lot of them made in China, reboxed and and sold as German. I don't, I don't know. That's what I'm thinking they are, but I, I don't, I don't can't prove that. But um, th that's the that's the problem is you end up with you still end up with crap parts you know even, and you're spending a lot more money and uh, some of them are good some of them are bad and it's just a it's a total buy it and see type of thing so um, these are pretty good I'm gonna say that these are right not very many bad ones in fact all the parts in this engine are pretty much Chinese except for the engine tin is German uh, but 
though they've kind of you know a lot of people say the uh, engine case in the oil hole for the oil pump you know in the earlier cases they had a lot of problems with the oil holes that weren't the right size and they had to o-ring a lot more pumps I believe they've got that pretty much narrowed down now unless you get a really old aluminum case you know so they've pretty much got a lot of those issues worked out you know a lot of the newer parts you know all the Chinese parts they, they went through R&D issues and stuff the ones that I don't use are definitely the and I don't know if they fixed it or not and I don't want to know and I don't want to put one in and try as the MP you know MP has some good parts and some bad ones the uh, MP camshafts we had problems with the cam and lifter kits I stay totally clear of those um, we were seeing uh, several engines going with flat cams uh, so through a, for some of the areas around here um, the cams would go flat in just a few minutes after you put them in that's a and that was a really rare situation on a typical Volkswagen because the cam is below the crankshaft usually they get plenty of oil and they usually don't go flat and some people were blaming that on the ZDDP changes in the oil you know, so ways to combat against some of those things we, we run STP so a little bit of STP has a uh, uh, that in it, uh, it has ZDDP in it, uh, and I always run Castrol. Um, some of the guys say, uh, "Look, uh, there's going to be a lot of opinions on this stuff." You know, I, they run Valvoline Racing. Don't think I haven't run all these different oils. Okay, Valvoline Racing. Some guys run, um, you know, straight oil, straight 50 weight, straight 30 weight, straight 40 weight. I found the 2050 Castrol, um, and the Kendall oil holds its viscosity the best when you take it back out of the motor after it's been after the engine after it's been running for I like to say that just to piss those guys off they keep saying that so when you put it back in the motor just to uh, you know you know after it's been in there and, and gotten dirty and everything else uh, it comes out in the same viscosity that it goes back in versus Penzo, old Quaker State, I mean, that stuff just turns to water. And, you know, as soon as you start the motor up, it's kind of like a diesel engine when you put oil in it. You know, some of the old diesel engines, not like my Duramax, but the old diesel engines, you put the oil in, and you, as soon as you start the motor up, you turn it back off, it's just water. You know, that's the way that all the other oils that I've tried, even Valvoline, um, I, you know, it has too much, too much detergent in it to me. I don't know what it is. I'm not an oil formula person, but I just know when I switched to Castrol years ago, um, it's it's been the best. And you know, as far as visco holding its viscosity, making the engine last longer, and uh, you know, I'm not sure on synthetics. You know, my other cars, I always run synthetic now. So everything else, I've changed to synthetic oil. But in the Volkswagen, uh, I'm not sure how it's going to like that with the really thin viscosity. That um, it turns into, it might find places to leak uh, easier than this well. So that's what we're just going to stick with, what works. So, and I'm not putting you know a gazillion miles on stuff. You know, on my other cars, you know, I got high high miles. I'll run three, four, five hundred thousand miles on an engine. And uh, I'm using this. So I don't know if I covered everything here. Um, the, you know, we're running a steel pulley here. I don't like the aluminum ones. Uh, Especially if you're running a sand seal. I, we're not running a sand seal. We have the oil slinger and um, with these You know with this oil slingers with, with the non oil slinger sand seal engine You definitely need a steel pulley the ones that are aluminum. You'll find that they crack and becomes unreliable I'm gonna get the haters uh, thermostat uh, out here where we live we See if you see here, um, if you have the flaps, okay, and, you, and you're in an area where it's, where you don't need thermostat. A lot of people say, oh, you need, always need a thermostat. You always need a thermostat. We don't need thermostats here. Been running them without them for years. I got friends with 150,000 miles on the engine with Chinese parts in it, and they are not, and he's still running it. So, um, you know. I don't know. Okay, you know maybe you'll get three hundred thousand miles out of your engine if you run thermostats. Highly unlikely, but it's a Volkswagen. I'd be surprised if it if it ever get that many miles. But anyway, um, your thermostat. If you have the if you have the flappers and you and you run them open, 
Um, what they can do is help direct the air to the right parts of the head and right parts of the, the engine to make it uh, work better. But the way I look at it, theoretically, um, is that with the Type 3 Engine 10 underneath, um, I believe that it's going to be just as efficient as without them. So that's my theory, not something that you know I'm telling you to do. None, none of this stuff is. You know, you can do it or not do it. So in California, there's we've had more we had more cars in the shop, and guys will totally tell me that's not true. Okay, but like I said, you know, well, if you watch my fuel filter video, you're gonna find out we see a lot of Volkswagens. I mean, this is the home of Empy. I live in Riverside, uh, home of Empy. There was more Volkswagens in Southern California probably than anywhere in the United States because of the air we have and because it's not the rust stuff like that um so you know we had no need for therm thermostats were actually causing more problems for us with them sticking we i i don't know how many i couldn't even tell you how many cars used to come in the shop that had thermostats and and they were stuck and the engine was completely burned up because the person just didn't know they just kept driving um if the Volkswagen person might know, you know, they'd know to go reach their hand underneath and feel, feel if there's air coming out. And if there's no air, then you know the thermostat's stuck. But um, we had a lot of them with that. And we found without running them here that there was no real problem with them running too cold because we'd never really get very cold here. You know, it, and as long as you warmed up your engine properly and just didn't, rev it up and stuff like that don't hop in it and fire it up and start revving it because guys are running you know dual carbs a lot here they were doing a lot of that stuff and and we didn't have problems with that with thermostats but if you're in an area where you know where uh it's it's really really cold and you're going to drive it in the winter which i would be surprised that you are but if you were in that situation where you're going to do that then you might want to consider putting the thermostat flaps in a thermostat in your car and it'll and you probably will not need the type 3 deflector 10 at all that would you know be kind of a waste for you and same thing with a 1600 if you're running a 1600 you know stock and you have uh let me see you have all your tin including this a lot of guys have this missing that's a that's an important piece to bring the air to the back of the car um and, and there's these two little ones that go right here. They're about this long. And you had the regular flaps underneath. Okay, the regular uh, deflector shields underneath. Not the Type 3 style, but the regular deflector shields underneath your cylinder tin. Um, on a 1600, like a single port, maybe on a dual port. Depends on how much power you're putting into it. Any extra stuff. You're probably fine. There's almost no need to change them to these. We only use these on... The um, high performance engines are engines that we thought were going to run hotter. So, and that's ones we found. We used that. We used data from those to find that we did get some cooler temperatures on the head. Because not everybody had head temperature sensor, but my friend did, and uh, we were he was the mechanic in the shop, and we tried it, and we found definite cooling results. They weren't like huge, but they were enough to want to do it. So those are the types of things. Uh, make sure you know. I make sure I have all the tin on. This oil line is temporary. Okay, when it gets in the car, it's not going to be here. It's not going to be touching the exhaust. Um, we're not sure exactly how we're going to run it, but we might run it underneath here and to the front, and then put them put the oil cooler up underneath. I'm not sure. Um, we haven't totally got to that. You know, the issue with these with the uh, full flow system. Is that the stuff comes out the side and it conflicts with your exhaust? So, you know, wrapping them might be a good idea. We might do that. You know, something like you know, some stuff like that. Just trying to show you guys some of this stuff. It, it took a long time. Believe it or not, all this, just all this assembly and man, you know, uh, making this stuff fit and you know, all that stuff takes a lot of time. We just couldn't get it all in the video, so I thought I'd just do a walk around. So anyway, that's it for the uh, engine. Uh, as before, we get a you guys stick around and come, come back later for the will it run, and uh, we'll be uploading that after this. I'll talk to you in the next video. Please like, share, and subscribe.